What you're about to hear is an analysis of the banking turmoil from the former deputy governor of the Bank of England, Sir Paul Tucker. For my full interview with Paul Tucker, as well as information about his most recent book, Global Discord, check out for the links in the description. Thanks, and let's hear what Paul Tucker has to say. The banking failures of the last um, fortnight or so are concerning and um, remarkable in some ways. I, I want to be backward looking on this. I don't want to say anything um, that could add to the noise about what is going on at the moment because I don't have all the information of those sitting in office. But I do have things to say about how we got to this place, and I'm afraid they're somewhat critical. So in the United States, we've seen um, a large regional uh, bank um, kind of fail, um, and partly because there was no resolution plan for it. What may not be widely known is that in 2019, the Federal Reserve and the FDIC effectively decided formally to cease resolution planning for large um, regional banks. Paul, what is a resolution plan? I think the fact that you don't know, and perhaps lots of your listeners and watchers don't know, viewers don't know, is why this has come about. So this is something that everybody ought to know about, and actually central bank governors, I'm already repeating things I said on the record when I was in office and since, central bank governors should talk about resolution policy a lot because everybody needs to know about it in advance. A resolution policy is a policy for taking a distressed bank, I mean, not just illiquid, but worse than illiquid, not something to be, that can be sorted out just by lending, that it's either solvent, insolvent, or not viable in some fundamental way, and getting it to shore or to safety without a taxpayer bailout. And that might be an orderly rundown, or it might be a recapitalization via what's called bailing in the bonds. Mm -hmm. So very simply, if you have at some one legal entity, a bank, um, it's got some deposit liabilities, it's been some insured, some uninsured, it's got some equity, but also it's issued some bonds. And if it gets into difficulty, um, insolvency difficulty, well, the equity is obviously lost, but the bonds could be converted into equity. And, and the bank is recapitalized. So this should be familiar to American corporate finance people because what I've just described is an administered Chapter 11 mm -hmm. rather than a negotiated Chapter 11. And the reason for it not being negotiated by a bankruptcy judge is you don't have time. Mm -hmm. And secondly, it has an international dimension to it that no corporate... Um, chapter 11 has to anything like the same degree. And it was agreed after the last um, crisis that there would be such resolution plans for everybody there of any significance. And uh, there's something called the key attributes, which is produced by a body that I happen to chair, but it's of no significance that I chaired it. Um, and the United States decided it 2090 Federal Reserve and the FDIC not to do such resolution planning on a regular basis for the large regional banks. And this was reckless um, because it wasn't obvious that they otherwise had credible resolution plans. And I used to chair a body called the Systemic Risk Council with an extraordinary uh, membership, Paul Volker, when he was with us, God rest his soul. Um, Jean-Claude Trichet, the um, president of the European Central Bank in the past, now Belling, who had chaired the Basel Committee, Bill Tolson, who chaired the SEC. Um, and I could go on. I mean, basically, uh, Sheila Baer, who created the um, Systemic Risk Council, who had chaired the FDIC. And we wrote a letter in 2019 to the Fed and the FDIC saying, you should not go ahead with these proposals that you have out for consultation because you it would involve stopping planning when you don't have a plan. And I am very sad. I am really very sad that it turned out they didn't have a plan. I will say angry things if I carry on. So I, I think I'll 
leave it there, but I think there's some accounting to be done. Because this was, this was, SVB is a pretty simple bank. I mean, plainly an incompetent bank that didn't even, didn't even manage to protect itself against interest rate risk by swapping um, its fixed rate assets into float rate. And the supervisors have some questions about that as well. And um, people are saying, I don't know whether it's true, that the United States also chose not to implement the 2016 guidelines on interest rate risk in the banking book. I don't know whether that's true, but lots of people are saying it. And people are circulating charts that show that European banks, which apparently in Europe the guidelines were implemented, that these charts show that European banks apparently have much smaller interest rate exposures than than many um, U.S. banks. So this isn't this isn't this bit isn't the resolution stuff was a bit new. This this bit isn't new. This is this isn't all lessons post the crisis. This is SNL um, crisis stuff. Um, Savings and loans in the 1980s and 90s where, yeah. But, you know, this is just the history of banking. Yes. This is stuff people have known um, forever. And on Credit Suisse, which is what people call a global SIFI, systemically important bank, there was a plan um, what's called single point of entry resolution, um, and uh, and that will have been a plan that I assume was maintained in close cooperation with the um, jurisdictions of the main Credit Suisse subsidiaries, which I guess but don't know the United States, the United Kingdom, and somewhere in Asia and somewhere in continental Europe. Um, and they didn't use that plan. And that the the um, chairman of the of the Swiss National Bank was quoted in the Financial Times yesterday as saying words to the effect, "Well, resolution is is only useful during normal times." And I want to believe that he was misquoted because. I don't see how anyone could think that sentence. I mean, if one of the top 20 financial institutions in the world is failing, it is not a normal circumstance. The resolution is, I gave speeches over the years saying, resolution is about being in a better circle of hell. And, you know, there's a risk that that image trivializes it, and I don't mean to. I mean, my generation did better than the generation of the 1930s. We did not have the Great Depression again, and no. that is something of to be grateful for, and something which, in a kind of small way, I'm proud of having been part of. But we said that the next generation can do quite a lot better than us, because we're leaving them with this technology, um, where you don't have to use taxpayers' money to bail these people out. Paul, I just uh, want to make sure I, I understand the the let's say the takeover of Silicon Valley Bank by the FDIC. Uh, they took it over. The Treasury then insured deposits over the $250,000 limit, and the FDIC embarked upon an attempt to sell the assets of Silicon Valley Bank, both the actual securities, the loans, but also the business units to various parties to attract bids in the same way you know, Sheila Baer from the FDIC did in 2008 with Washington Mutual, for, for example. Uh, according to reporting from Bloomberg, I saw that there were bids, but those bids were not taken for reasons uh, that were unclear. What would your resolution plan would have done different? Than- oh, okay. Yeah. So I think I think SBB does have two entities at least. There's an operating bank and there's a holding company. Um, the there would have been an internal debt between the operating bank and the holding company. Uh, the holding company. Um, would have have issued, as well as equity to the market, it would have issued bonds to the market. And there'd be nothing else going on at the holding company level at all. No derivatives, contracts, or anything like that. The the um, operating company, um, what I'm going to say doesn't depend on any details of SVB. Mm. Um, the, the operating company gets into difficulty, it loses its equity, its equity is written off, 
Um, but the internal low and not bond between the holding company and the operating company that gets converted into equity. Mm-hmm. So, so the operating company is now recapitalized. So then the question is, is the holding company now still solvent or is it bust? If it's solvent, move forward. If it's bust, well, then you have to have a resolution at the holding company level. And that would involve, um, writing off the equity because it's bust. And the bondholders, they they become their bonds get converted into equity, or sufficient of their bonds, sufficient proportion of their bonds is converted into equity to recapitalize the group, and they become the ownership of the group moves from the equity hold the previous equity holders to the old bondholders who are now the equity holders. Now in the United States, for various complicated reasons, um, this would be done via a bridge. Um, company administered by the FDIC, but all of that is detail. Um, it's kind of important detail to executing it. It's not important detail in terms of understanding the basic structure. I actually think it would have been quite easy um, in in this particular case. And the Systemic Risk Council letter from Volker, Trichet, Sheila Bear, myself, and many others in 2019 said, you should seriously consider um, requiring regional banks to issue this bail-inable debt as part of having a bail-in resolution plan for them. I don't understand why that wasn't done. And, it, and actually, had they done it, it, it's not just that it would have avoided the actions that you're describing, which it would have. Also, something else, something rather marvelous would be being said now, which is, my God, we seem to have overcome the problem of big bank failures. Not the very biggest bank, but actually by showing that that could have worked for a medium-sized um, bank, it would have given people much greater faith um, that it would work for the very large institutions. So I think, I think that um, what's happened was avoidable, um, and, and I think that is a... I think that raises pretty big questions about banking policy going forward, but it's not quite the moment to be to be addressing those questions because there's still a degree of nervousness out there, of course. Definitely. And, and um, the Federal Reserve hasn't yet got inflation under control. So my own view is that the central banks didn't need to continue QE on quite the scale they did during the whole of 2020. My view is that this is without hindsight. My view is that when the um, Biden administration um, launched the very large fiscal stimulus in 2021, the Federal Reserve should have raised interest rates a bit. Um, so I've got them stopping QE 2000, in, in the middle of 2020, and I've now got them raising interest rates in 2021. In, in parts of Europe, the labor force um, shrank very sadly because lots of people have got long COVID and, um, and other people have chosen to retire early, which all of which is kind of part of that is sad and part of it not so sad. Um, that reduces the labor force and therefore aggregate supply is on a lower path and therefore you need to push aggregate demand onto a lower path so you need to have tighter policy. Um, but instead they said, no, we... We, they carried on stimulating. It wasn't just that they were sitting still. They carried on stimulating policy during um, this period. And and then they said inflation was transitory. And I think there was quite an important symbolic mistake during that period in that they didn't sound very concerned about inflation. And I think that's a great hazard for a central banker uh, because you, you must always be concerned about inflation getting out of control upwards or downwards into deflation. It's symmetric. But you, the people talk about the anchor. The anchor is the committee. The anchor is the men and women on these committees. And, and, and people need to feel completely assured that they care about maintaining the anchor above everything else, everything else. And so I think that there have been unforced errors in monetary policy and that they're now playing catch up 
And I think the markets and others have found that difficult because after many years of forward guidance, people often criticize QE. And I, I, I would be crit critical of QE for going on so long. But I think people don't criticize forward guidance enough. Forward guidance is a form of addiction for the market. They'll, oh, they'll tell us what they're going to do. And they'll tell us what they're not going to do. Well, a serious policy moved away from the zero and lower bound. Um, actually, we were back to a world where the so-called forward guidance wasn't a commitment. It was a prediction. But it was a prediction when they didn't know what was going to happen in the world. When people used to have got this stupid expression, data dependence. I mean, what you're meant to do as a central bank is sit around in your office reading data because you don't know what's going to happen. Um, but what you do form a view on is you have an expectation um, and you have some uncertainty around that central expectation and you have to form a view on the balance of risks. Are they to the upside or are they to the downside? And you can have different risks for growth and, and inflation. And I think if they stuck to those old techniques of, of communicating and therefore thinking about monetary policy, uh, we wouldn't be quite where we are because they would have been somewhat more preemptive. And so there's a lot more to be navigated yet. I mean, this is so soon after the last crisis. I mean, I would never have guessed and I, that, that, that people would have relaxed their vigilance so quickly after the last crisis. And look what's happened socially, culturally, constitutionally even on in both sides of the Atlantic. I mean, big financial crises, they dislocate our societies in, in really difficult ways. And we've got to have policies for dealing with them. And we've got to have policies that officials stick to. So in the United States with the regional banks, they didn't even bother to have a policy. And in, in Switzerland, it seems that they had a policy and then didn't carry it out. And, you know, I hope I'm wrong about those things. And, and for those concerned, I apologize if, if I have got the facts and my interpretation of the facts wrong. And so a bailout is injection of liquidity that's either funded by the government or just central banks. And, 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 and a, that, that's a bailout. But a bail-in is when the bondholders are forced to take losses. The, a bailout, I, as I use the word bailout, a bailout is when, um, is when taxpayers provide solvency support in some way or guarantees. I don't think providing liquidity against good collateral is a bailout. I mean, bank I'm, is runnable. Bank I agree with you. Yeah. Runnable. If I if I sitting there or you know the people who are in central banking, if they lend against um, collateral, you know, sensibly valued uh, with with haircuts, that's not a bailout. Mm -hmm. The bank the bank has to repay, and if it doesn't repay, you realize the collateral. I mean, right? Yeah, I. I agree with you. If I was a dictator, I would not call the recent actions a bailout, but everyone else is calling it a bailout. So that's, you know what I mean? Well, it really, it, you know, the, the policymakers here, I mean, if I may say so, um, for really senior levels, just need to get America away from this language. And the best way to do that is to talk about these issues during financial peacetime. Mm -hmm. Yes. Too many speeches about monetary policy many of which turned out to be not very enlightening as it happened. You know, it's just bad luck. And not enough speeches about this kind of thing. And yet when it happens, it's the most important thing ever. Yes, it is. And, they've, and you know, good crisis management is made during financial peacetime. It is not made in the midst of crisis. One can, you know, banks aren't new things. No. And that, the, you know, Fulton at the end of the 18th century wrote instructively about this. My predecessors in the Bank of England in the canonical crisis in 1866 wrote instructively about this. Um, and the time for debate and discussion and, you know, the best sense of the word education uh, is during financial peacetime. And I hope that going forward, the leaders of the Fed uh, and at the ECB and elsewhere will talk about resolution policy during financial peacetime. Because why do we supervise bank regulate and supervise banks at all? It's because of the costs of failure, the prudential regulation, not the conduct regulation. Well, we should work backwards from what are we going to do when they do fail? No one's ever going to supervise 
although it's possible that banks weren't supervised well here, no one's ever going to supervise banks well enough to prevent failure. So policy has to be reoriented to what will we do when there is a failure and how does that we need to convey what we will do in ways that shape incentives. Because the bondholders should have been charging in the structure I'm describing, the bondholders would have been charging at premium. And that would have that would have provided a signal of 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 of, of some deterioration. Whereas in the equity market, the equity market's wonderful, but the equity market is populated by optimists. Yes. Still they're not. Bond markets are popular, corporate bond markets are populated by people that have a better balance between um, pessimism and optimism because they, they've got some risk mm-hmm. so they don't get repaid. Uh, and we need somehow, I mean, now my aim when I was involved with this was, you know, to put it in a kind of slightly silly way, was I really wanted banking to be part of capitalism, to be part of a market economy. Mm-hmm. And that should remain, I think that should remain the goal. Because if not, you know, somebody is going to say persuasively, we've just got to break all of these things up. I believe you referenced uh, Walter Badgett, who you know, had to say that you should central banks should lend freely against good collateral at high levels of interest. If we apply that... To dictum, sound institutions. To sound institutions, thank to you. To sound institutions. So that is rarely, rarely... Um, so Badgett was writing after this crisis in 1866. And what happened in 1866 is that the Bank of England, uh, my former shop, they let Overend and Gurney go bust. And no one that's watching this will have heard of Overend and Gurney. And Overend and Gurney was gigantic in Britain, the most powerful country in the world in the 1860s. And then having let Overend and Gurney go bust, because it was fundamentally unsound. And they had ins- what we would call inspectors go in and have a look to check that. A former governor and two other people went in and have a look at the books and advised, don't lend. Um, and then, of course, there was contagion. And then they led to everybody against good collateral. And they, they more or less stabilized um, the market. And everyone always takes from that story, I mean, Kind of emphasizing this rather. Everyone always takes that st- away from that story. Um, it's 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 being prepared to lend against collateral. That's absolutely true. It's vital. But the first part of the story is important too. Don't lend to unsound firms. Um, but what my generation tried to add. But if you're not going to lend to the unsound firm, then you need a plan, which we call a resolution plan for the unsound firm not to collapse in a disorderly way. Mm. Yes. So you need liquidity policy and you need resolution policy and everything else in prudential policy should work backwards from that. So I would hone in on two things, lend against good collateral and then at high levels of interest. Good collateral, the government, U.S. government securities that can be pledged in the bank term funding program, they're certainly of extremely high credit quality but they have fallen in value because of interest rate risk as interest rates have risen. And the bank uh, a program lends $100 uh, at par value instead of what the market value would say. And then also the high rate of interest, it's I think the overnight, uh, it, it's the index sw- swap plus 10 basis points. Is that a high rate of interest? So on the first bit, I mean, if the counterpart is to fall and the Fed end up holding treasuries and they hold the treasuries to maturity, they're not going to lose money. That's why they'll be lending at par. Mm-hmm. On the interest rate, what matters actually is that you lend, it's not so much at a high rate of interest, it's at a rate of interest that is higher than the market rate. And so it needs to It needs to be, it's like an ex post insurance premium. Um so whether that's high enough, I'm not close enough to the detail to form a judgment. These are when you get to the real details of things, you really do need to be part of the situation to make yes. that. But the principles should be articulated um, before. Um, the other thing you said is good collateral. It's it's actually this is an expression kind of that one can be slightly loose about. One could lend against risky collateral as long as one understands it, knows how to value it, and knows what haircut to to, to set. So portfolios of loans, you can lend against those as long as you are 
the condition that I hope the Bank of England still has, it's the one that I authored, I think, which is, well, we, sh we should only ever take things as collateral that um, which we are capable of managing ourselves and we are capable of valuing. So I should have put that the other way around. Mm. So, you know, um, I think for some types of collateral, the New York Fed has occasionally or systematically hired outside bodies, asset managers to help them with. We 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 didn't do that. We trained up. We had a in the last crisis we had a fortnight or so where we had a firm behind a Chinese wall teach an absolutely top quality squad of Bank of England people how to do various things. But I was firmly of the view, and so was the then Governor Mervyn King, that if we lent against collateral we had to be capable of managing it ourselves. Because if the counterparty defaulted, we would be the owner um, of that collateral. I mean, when you take collateral, um, you always have to think about yourself as a contingent outright owner of those instruments. Mm -hmm. I mean, collateral, in my view, other than setting interest rates, collateral policy is what central banks do. And I think part of the solution for the liquidity problems in banks, Irvin King has advocated a version of this, and I've advocated a version of it. Uh, I, I would have banks um, cover the entirety of their short-term liabilities with assets that are discountable to the central bank or central banks around the world at the discounted value. Paul, that makes such eminent sense. I don't imagine an argument that would be against that. Why is that not policy? Well, I hope it will be, and I hope all your listeners and viewers will say, this is a great policy. Where can we find where Tuck has written about this, where King's written about this? We both have. We both sent it out at some length, and I think it should happen. And, and this debate about should we raise the deposit insurance ceiling, which has been going on here in the United States, yes. is would go away in these circumstances. Because what the deposit insurance debate blurs is how are we handling a liquidity crisis and how are we handling a solvency crisis? A liquidity crisis, every, everybody with a short-term claim would be covered in by the system I just described because the central bank would lend, could be vast amounts of money, mm -hmm. would lend against collateral, much of it prepositioned with the central bank, so long as the bank was sound. And if the bank wasn't sound, it would go through a resolution procedure where the not only the insured depositors, but the uninsured depositors would would take losses after equity, after the bail-in bonds, after subordinated debt. And actually, I think, I, I've written this out in one place, I think that the authorities ought to prescribe more the capital stack so that uninsured depositors, they get covered by my liquidity thing, or maybe it's a liquidity thing, or when it's just a liquidity problem, and when it's a solvency thing, they they eventually get all their money back, and possibly very quickly, um, because there are so many layers of protection um, ahead of that. And I think bank supervisors just haven't, they, they've continued to focus mainly on prophylactic supervision. And, and, you know, I believe in prophylactic supervision. It's a job that I did as a young man. Um, but I think the most important thing is to work backwards from failure. What would you do if it's illiquid? What would you do if it, it's insolvent? And perhaps there are other scenarios as well, I don't know. And I don't think they have done that. Um, they either haven't as planned as much on that as they should have done, or they have planned and they haven't stuck to the plans. And yeah, I think it's too early to be sure on that. For me, it looks as though the United States didn't do the plans, and for the regional banks, and for Switzerland, it looks to me as though they had a plan and didn't stick to it. And I think, you know, um, but I, I, w I want to be wrong about this, by the way. So the debt ceiling debate is being, is, is, we're at that part of the political cycle um, again, and it's important to put it like that because this has happened before, and it's a hard knuckle combat within the Beltway where the stakes are pretty high in terms of domestic politics. 
And I want to say, um, this has come up since my book was published, but there's an, a, a similar example in the book, but this is a better one. Um, I want to say, no, no, it's not like before. Vote default, vote Beijing. That, that, if, that if the debt ceiling isn't lifted and the United States defaults, that's a gift to Beijing. And I don't think this has crossed people's minds because the very people that um, are contemplating a default are probably among the people most worried about the challenge presented to the United States by Beijing. And my point isn't to make criticisms of individuals in Congress or elsewhere, let alone of that party platform, but everybody's just got to raise their game in a way that my generation of policymakers didn't need to. Mm -hmm. I mean, extraordinary challenge of the times that our political leaders need to be bigger uh, just to, during a period where for a while, probably in many places, they've been smaller. You talked about the capital stack. There's equity, then pref you know, preferred, all the way down to uh, de depositors who should, who should get paid uh, first. I believe it's the case in the uh, takeover of Credit Suisse by UBS that those bail-in bond holders were paid out nothing, while the equity holders were took a severe haircut. Uh, however, they did get something. Is there precedent uh, of that? Well, I, 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 I'm not going to answer your question at any length, and that's because... Um, I've read the emergency legislation in English, but I haven't read it in German, and English isn't an official language of Switzerland. And although I am aware of the prospectus terms um, of of the Swiss codes, I have not reread the prospectus. Um, I think there is a question about if there were rights in the prospectus for the AT ones to be written down under contract. Why was uh, a provision needed in the emergency law to write them down as well? Um, normally, people are quite careful about doing that because if you put something in statute, it implies you need to do so, which implies they weren't satisfied that the contract covered it. But uh, because that may be a misunderstanding, and uh, I think that. I actually think that although that is understandably what the market is is fussed about now, I think the bigger questions are, you had a plan. Why didn't you carry it through? And Thomas Jordan say, well, the resolution is for normal circumstances. Don't, I mean, you know, of course it's not. The failure of a SIFI isn't normal. Um, um, so I think, and, and you know, what is the resolution plan for UBS? I mean, that question will need to be answered at some point, not in a great rush. It's important that things calm down, um, first of all. Paul, you I think that, so I think the set of issues raised by Switzerland is different from the set of issues raised here. The set of issues raised here is seems to me less excusable, but more easily repaired. And I, and I want to finish on this note, if I may, uh, which is, because this feel like two conversations. Yes. Given the geopolitics, and this is this is in my book towards the end, the West cannot afford another financial crisis. It cannot. Um, what we saw last time was Beijing felt that it could be more assertive and more confident in the world. I am not somebody that believes we ought to be aggressively trying to contain China and things like that. Planning to do that, that's at all realistic. Mm -hmm. But is that, well, uh, we shouldn't have any problem with the Chinese people or with their civilization, which is magnificent. We've, we've got a problem with the party and they've got a problem with us. And um, But the thing for us to do, we can't, they're so big and so successful and, and they've got so much human capital. Um, what we can do is avoid, we can avoid being over-dependent, where being over-dependent could hurt us in bad states of the world. We must keep friends and allies around the world. Washington hasn't always been very attentive to that. And it needs to be it needs to be persistently attentive to it with everybody really. And secondly, we can't afford to make mistakes. Our biggest mistakes and problems concern 
democracy and discontent and things. We also can't afford to make technical mistakes. And one of them is we cannot afford afford another financial crisis. And this isn't the hardest thing in the world to afford. And those people that press for deregulation, not deregulation of conduct type things, which is a, you know, which is different political parties have different views, but. But wanting deregulation of stability policy is to jeopardize America, to jeopardize the West and our way of life. And we, you know, it's, we just got to get a grip, frankly, around the importance of stability in the financial system is as important as stability in prices. We want, we want low and stable inflation and a resilient financial system. And this isn't some luxury. This is a precondition for sustaining our way of life. You said financial stability as important as price stability, implying that they are equal. A horrible question to have to ask, but what if central bankers have to make a choice between one? No, they won't have to. They won't won't have to. It's it's, this this debate about trade-offs and things. It's so silly. I mean... When there's a desperate financial crisis, aggregate demand and spending and confidence collapses. Um, and as some of the central bankers have pointed out, they've got instruments for catering both. But when it comes to it, there's never really a clash. Over, I mean, I think myself, I thought that at the time that when in the mid of the last decade, 2016, 17, when fiscal policy was switched off effectively, and the whole job of trying to revive the economy fell um, to monetary policy, which was which itself a problem, but not something central banks could control. I thought at that point that central banks and regulators should have been increasing minimum haircuts and creating increasing minimum margin requirements to reduce the increase in leverage in traded markets. And those are powers they have, including in the US. And um, there's a kind of awesome beat with the USO, and they haven't got the powers to do this, that, and the other. And they haven't got quite as many powers as in Europe, but they've got they've got powers to do what I've just described, and they should have done they should have done that. You're absolutely right. In a panic, lending stops, and that can be very deflationary. I, I just read this morning that very few investment banking deals are being done in, in the wake of the fall of, of uh, Silicon Valley Bank. Uh, Paul, it's been an absolute pleasure to hear your insights so generous with, with your time and your, your knowledge. And thank you also for tying a bow on those two conversations. I felt like we had two conver- two excellent conversations, one about geopolitics, one about central banking. So I'm glad you connected at the end. Uh, your book is Global Discord, and everyone who is watching this interview uh, needs to go out and buy it. Paul, thank you so much, and thank you everyone for watching. Well, thank you very much, and, to, and again, to your audience.